Well, I'm glad to be back. Um, uh, Brother Campbell uh, had texted me and we were talking and he told me that they were thinking, you were thinking about having me come back and then Mike called me the other month and said, you know, we'd like to have you come back. So uh, that's a good thing. That's a blessing. Um, this is the only, this is the second time I've been in this area and, uh, you know, I'll come back any, any time anyone needs me. As an evangelist, you know, I'll go wherever God wants me to go. That's what I want to do. And so even if it's to travel many, many hours to preach one sermon, I'll do that. And I have done that. And it's my calling to do, and that's all I want to do. So for those who uh, may not have been here last time, or for those listening, uh, we'll see on the, uh, the video, I'll introduce myself. So uh, my name is Corey Trout, as he said. I got saved in late 2011, and shortly thereafter, I joined my home church, and in 2017, God called me to be an evangelist. I know he called me to be an evangelist specifically, not just to be a, a preacher. I know it's to be an evangelist specifically. And I got ordained uh, in March 2021, and I've been out ever since, going wherever God wants me to go, uh, even just going out and attending uh, conferences. I attended a conference in Suffolk, Virginia, uh, the other month, and so even when I'm not out preaching, I'm keeping myself busy, going out soul winning around my area. Uh, if I don't have any place to go preach, I'll, I'll go out soul winning, and I do that often, and so I'm always trying to keep myself busy. Um, if my uh, ministry had a scripture verse connected to it, it would be Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Every word of God is pure. Not some, not most, every word, which means every word in this book is pure. And when we read his words, we're reading pure words. I love looking up his words in dictionaries. If every word of God is pure, I want to know what those words mean. So um, on your way out, if you want, I have some prayer cards over there. It has uh, my social media uh, uh, handles on there and Facebook and Instagram, so if you want to follow me in my journeys, grab one, and you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram to you know, follow me on my journeys. I also have a book over there uh, that I wrote. It has over 70 names of God that I have comments on each. I wrote it. It's free. If you want to take one, you can take one. If you want one for someone else, take as many as you want. They're free. And so you can grab one on the way out if you want. So that's about myself. Now let's turn to the Word of God. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. And as you turn there, I'm going to pray. God of heaven, you gave us every word in your book for a purpose. It's so that we can learn about you, how we can learn about salvation, and then get close to you. And we can learn these things only from your word. Not from anything else, but from your words only. This book tells us how to live, how to get closer to you. These are the only words that you want us to read, to get closer to you. We can read other things written by preachers that contain your words, that can help us, but the source has to be your words. This is your foundation that you have given us. Let us read it as the foundation of our life, your book. In Christ's name, amen. amen. So we're going to read Revelation chapter 16 and verses 1 through 11. Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. And I heard a great voice out of the temple. Well, before I read, so the context of this, this is occurring during the tribulation period. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of the waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, and wast, and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. 
For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And verses 9 through 11, which is going to be our text verse. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. For this sermon, we will be looking at verses 9 through 11 to see what we can learn from those scriptures to better our lives and to get closer to God. How so? It is written, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So that is an amazing verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means all scripture was given by inspiration of God. We can trust these words because God himself gave us his words. And then he moved men to make copies through the generations. This lays that foundation. And it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. One may say, how can I read the book of Revelation that's, door, that's speaking uh, about things during the tribulation period, which we are not in, it is in the future. How can I read something from there and apply myself to those things, learn from those things? Well, scripture says we can. So that's what we're going to do. So the context, it's crucial to understand the context of the verse that you're reading. So the context is, this is happening during the tribulation period. Many things are happening. God's anger is being poured out upon the world as it had never been before. And very, very bad things are happening during this time. And the men who were blaspheming God in this passage, uh, they were not saved people, right? They were not saved people. And they were blaspheming God. There are, we, uh, we he read in other passages from Revelation that there will be saved people going through, uh, who are alive going through the tribulation. They're going to be killed. But here, this is speaking about ungodly men. But even though, even so, because all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, all scripture, we can even learn things from these passages to better our lives. Yes. And that's what we're going to do. Having understood the proper context of Revelation chapter 16, let's see what we can learn from those things. We will look at how these scriptures can or we will look at how these scriptures can apply to as well as help both lost people and saved people. So, during this sermon, I'm going to be looking at these scriptures and applying lost people to them, and saved people to them, to see how someone could see, wow, this is not good, I need to get saved, and someone who's saved go, wow, this could help me. So let's start with Revelation chapter 9. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. They were scorched with heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, they blasphemed his name. For those who are not saved today, those who have not asked Jesus Christ by name, save them. When life becomes unbearable, when things are going bad, it does no good to blaspheme God or to use his name as a curse word. He has power to change lives. He has power to turn evil to good, to turn cursing to blessing, and vice versa. And we see in Revelation chapter 16 that, the things, that things got worse for everyone that blasphemed the name of God. So if you're listening on the live stream, if you're here today and you're not saved and you get angry about the world, things are going bad for you and you start getting angry at God, uh, 
That is very dangerous. God is very long-suffering towards lost people. He was long-suffering to me before I got saved, so he is. But it's never a good thing. And the more you blaspheme God as a lost pe person because you're angry, the further you're going to get away from God. Even though you're not saved, you're, you may become so hardened in your heart that it becomes more difficult to get saved. Now, anyone can get saved, I believe, if you go so far to extreme. There can be times when something happens, God breaks your heart, you get saved. But it's not a good thing if you're not saved, uh, especially if you're not saved, to uh, use God's names as curse words or to blaspheme him when things are going bad. It's just not a good thing. If you were to turn your heart to God, believe on him, say, okay, things are going bad, but God can help me. I am a sinner. And turn your heart to him and confess with your mouth Jesus Christ. He'll save you, and then your life will get better. For those who are saved, when things in life become difficult, we must not utter any negative words to God. We must not speak any evil words at all, for he hears everything. Saved people are not exempt from, in their flesh and in their soul, becoming angry with God. We see throughout the scriptures, many times, God's own people got angry with God. That doesn't mean they necessarily weren't saved. That's their flesh. It's the natural part of us, the flesh, which has not yet been glorified. We have a new spirit upon salvation, but our flesh is still sinful. God said, or uh, Paul said, woe unto me, who will deliver me from the body of this death? When I sin, it's my flesh. So even saved people can get upset with God. And that's not a good thing, especially if you're saved, we see in the scriptures. So don't allow yourself to become angry with God, especially to curse with, uh, use his name as a curse word. Saved people uh, can do that. It's not good, but we have to be on guard when that happens. So do not, just stop yourself. As soon as you get angry, stop yourself from going further because you don't know how far you will go and you might end up saying, how did I get to this point? Immediately stop yourself. Verse 16 again. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, being angry at God because of our circumstances and speaking negatively to him or about him results in no good thing and may lead to unpleasant consequences. God is not someone we ought to be angry with. First and foremost, because he never does anything wrong. Everything he does is perfect and right. Everything God does, even if I were to sin against God and he were to bring upon me something that I find very, very unpleasant, what, he, what he's doing is perfect, it's just, it's right, even if I find it unpleasant, and he's doing it perhaps because I had sinned against him. And so that has to be in your mindset. Even if things go bad. Now, humans can take things upon themselves and do evil to other people. You ought not to say, well, this is from God. You have to be careful about, you know, if, if it's from God or if it's from the devil or if it's from a person. But here in this revelation, God is pouring out these things upon people and they're blaspheming God. Nothing God does is wrong. He does everything is, everything he does is perfect, even if in our flesh we don't necessarily like it. But we have to turn our heart to God and say, everything he does is right. That's part of submitting yourself to him. God is merciful, slow to anger, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Even so, while those things are true, as we see many times in the scriptures, refusing God and angering him is quite unwise. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 23 through 28. Turn you at my reproof. God wants us to, when he reproves us, he wants us to turn when he reproves us. That's what he wants. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. That's a good thing. If we sin, if we do something wrong, God is uh, punishing us. Don't get angry at God. Don't say, why is this happening? And then shake your fist at him. Turn to him while he's reproving you. Turn to him. Bow unto him. Don't run away from him. Don't get angry at him. Turn to him. And he says uh, here, uh, let's see, I kind of lost it. He says, turn to you at my reproof. I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. But 
it also continues, because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh, cometh upon you. Then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. God is very long-suffering, but if we keep refusing him and refusing him and refusing him, and then bad things keep happening, and we get angry at God, and we ought not to, and we keep going further and further, God may just say, all right, you're saved, but you know what? I'm just going to let you go in that direction because you want to go in that direction. He's still your savior. You're still saved. Think of the son in the Gospels who went into the world, and he, so many things befell him. And the, the father was still his father, but the son went through many things. So never, ever, ever get angry at God if he reproves you because of your sin. Always go to him. And when things are going bad in life, just in general, never get angry at God. All because of those situations. Always turn to him. The prophet Isaiah said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. you got to turn to God, you have to turn to him. Going back to the book of Revelation, chapter 16, or chapter 16 verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. His kingdom was full of darkness. How can we apply ourselves to this? During the darkest moments in your life, when everything seems like it's full of gloom, know that God can move in your life. Just because there is darkness doesn't mean God can't come and make things better. The first time the word darkness occurs in the scripture is Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Isn't that interesting? The first time the word darkness occurs in scripture, we see the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the dark waters, and he was doing that to turn the earth into something beautiful and something that could be used by him. So even in your darkest moments, when God doesn't seem like he's there, even perhaps because you've gone away from God, you've stopped praying, you've stopped reading the scriptures, you've been sinning, you've been going away from God, things seem dark and gloomy, and as though there's no hope, know that if you go to God, he can turn that darkness to light. And if things are just dark because of the world and circumstances, because of life, God can come if you let him and turn your darkness into light. If you're not saved, God can turn your darkness to light, your emptiness to fullness. He can. There, there's the cliche, I'm too sinful, I'm too far away from God, uh, you know, God can never help me. That is absolutely not too, true. The scripture says that it's the will of the Father that none perish, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're never too far away from God to ask for forgiveness and salvation. If you are saved and things seem dark, understand that God can turn your gloom to joy, your shadows to light. If you have gone astray, you must return to him. We read in, the Ma in Malachi chapter 3, Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But he said, Wherein shall we return? Wherein shall we return, they asked. If someone has gone astray, if someone's not reading the scriptures as they ought to, if someone's not praying, and they think, well, you know, why is God? And they didn't really think about it. These people said, where have we gone astray? Where, in, where shall we return? If you feel as though you're a little bit distant from God, he's not there as much as he could be, and you don't understand why, what you ought to do is open the scriptures, pray to God, say, okay, what do I need to get closer to you? Because I don't know. And when we see in Malachi, God answers them. This is why. And if you read the scriptures and ask God to show you from the scriptures how to get even closer to him, and you mean it, 
He will open the scriptures to you and you'll say, ah, I need to stop doing that. I need to start doing this. Maybe this is what that is. And then God will help you. Going back to Revelation verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. They gnawed their tongues for pain. Here we see an angel pouring out distresses upon many people. How can we apply ourselves to these things and learn from them? How about when life in general pours out distresses upon us, or a person pours out their hurtful ways upon us? We must not be like the people in of Revelation chapter 16, and become angry with God when bad situations arise and befall us. We should instead give glory unto God for having all power, for indeed God is all powerful. The Lord says of himself in Isaiah chapter 45 verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And in another place, the Lord says of himself, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. God has all power to kill and to heal, to form light, to make darkness, to, to do all of these things. Why would we ever want to get away from him? Why would we ever want to argue with him when things get bad and get on his bad side? We see how God deals with his own people, saved people, in the scriptures. And those things turn out not to be pleasant for saved people in the scriptures. The same things can befall us. We're not exempt from them. The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning so that we might not do those things. We have no excuse no excuse to get away from God. No excuse to sin against God. We have it written in front of us. The manual is written in front of us, God's book. And understand that God has all power. I mean, if God says, I form the light, I mean, see the balance of God and the power of God. I form the light and I create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. Uh, I heal and I wound. I, I kill and I make alive. I, the Lord, do all these things. Never get on his bad side, even if you're saved. As we see through the scriptures, saved people angered God and things became unpleasant for them. But thank God we are eternally saved. So any bad thing that may befall us. But again, if things are going bad, turn to him. Turn to God. He's not just some big guy in the sky. He's God. Revelation chapter 16, verse 10 and 11 and the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. His kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds, and blasphemed the God of heaven of their pains and their sores. For people who are not saved, they were without God in this life. Why then would they argue and curse God with their words when he could snuff them out? And the reason they do those things is because they're ignorant. Ignorant. Before I got saved, I did and said many things that I thought, why would I do that? But they're ignorant. They don't understand. Someone who's not saved cannot understand because the scripture teaches that the, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they're foolish. So when we see a wicked person cursing, blaspheming God, listening to bad music, because we know the truth, we want to say, why would they do that? But they don't know better. They, that's all they know. They're just their natural self. But even so, God can move in, convict them to salvation, get them saved, and then they'll start seeing. To those who are saved, when various things in life become grievous, don't speak against God. Don't allow yourself to become angry or upset with Him. Nothing good comes from such things. Instead, turn your heart toward God and bless Him when bad things happen. Don't, don't say, oh, thank you. Well, you could say, thank you, God, for these challenges. If you're really spiritual, you may do that. But at least turn to God instead of uh, getting upset with him. And do this with all patience. Job did. The Holy Ghost moved James to write, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. 
It's very interesting that sometimes when, so the, the way that I get my sermons is, I, I open the scriptures and I say, God, I don't know what they need. Show me from the scriptures. And then I pray and I read and I pray and I read until God shows something to me. Like I get that tunnel vision, this, and then I build my sermon upon this. And it's interesting how while I'm building my sermon and writing it over the week or so, how many things that I'm, that I'm working on for the sermon befall me. Many things that I'm preaching right now, I, I surprisingly went through the past uh, week and a half, and there were times when I got upset, and I had to stop myself and turn to God and just start saying, God... You do all things. You make light. You make darkness. You are all powerful. And the more you extol God, the more you're getting in your spirit, out of the flesh, out of the soul, and then you start feeling better instead of being upset. So I am preaching these things to you, but know that, interestingly, I was... uh, I had many of these things come up in the past week. So I understand. I'm not just preaching it as though I don't understand. And I think God does that sometimes with preachers. When they're preparing a sermon, God wants them to. And then you go through those same things while you're preparing the sermon. Maybe, perhaps, God does that so that the preacher goes, I'm not just saying this because I, you know, I just wrote it. Uh, I understand. And it is difficult sometimes. When we get upset with God, you need to... Or um, not when we get upset with God. We shouldn't get upset with God. But if you get upset with someone else, if someone does something wrong to you that doesn't necessarily require going to the authorities, you know what I'm saying, you need to, don't get upset. Stop. Scripture says, the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And in the book of Jude, uh, we see uh, Michael the archangel was contending with the devil And even the Michael the archangel said to the devil, the Lord rebuke thee. So we ought not to do things out of anger. Always use a scriptural reason for what you're doing. And don't go to the book of Psalms and say, well, King David killed his enemies. There's always a place and a balance for everything. That was okay that King David did that. God allowed that. He was a king. He had to protect his people. But for us common people, just take everything in context. So now everyone turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. While you're turning there, to sum up the things said during this sermon, take what God says in his written scriptures and consider those things diligently for yourself. It's not selfish to sometimes think of yourself. I need to apply myself to these things. I need to do these things to get closer to God. If I am saved, is there anything in my life hindering me from getting even closer to God? And if you're not saved, you better consider yourself because you have no part of God. In in fact, Scripture says after salvation, uh, you uh, you know God. Rather, you are known of God. Someone who's not saved, God knows they're alive, but they're not one of his. And that's very, very dangerous. So consider yourself. Pray for others. If you see someone who needs help, help them. But consider yourself as well. It's not selfish to say, I need help. I want to get closer to God from the scriptures. That's a good thing. So you have heard from the scripture. You have heard of God from the scripture. Now arises the question. Are you saved? Only you know that. If you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? Those even listening on the video, you asked yourself this question. If yes, then why? Why? Why would you go to heaven? Why? Can you give a reason? Why? What reason would you give? You may say, I believe that God exists. That should be good enough. But the Holy Ghost moved John, or excuse me, the Holy Ghost moved James to write, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Just because you believe that there is a God, it might get you in the right direction, but you're not, that doesn't mean that you're saved. That is a powerful scripture. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. I love how God worded that. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Then you make makes you think, oh wow, is it just enough to believe that God exists? No. 
Can you give a scripture reason? Can you give a reason from God's book alone, only his book, as to why you will go to heaven? You may say, I try to be a good person. I, do, I try to do th- good things. We know the Ten Commandments. Well, the scripture says, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And then another scripture says, By the deeds of the law there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Just because we do good things doesn't mean anything. God sees our righteousnesses, plural, our righteousnesses, as filthy rags. God will not accept filthy rags. Earlier this year, I, w- I went to a, a lake that was having an event, and I stood in one place with a bunch of salvation tracks, and I was handing them out, and there was this um, older individual, and I said, would you like a salvation track? And they said, no, 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 I go, I go to church, I, and I try to be a good person, you know, I try to do things. And I said, well, the scripture says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And that individual said to me, God would never say that, and they walked away. I, that is a true story. That person actually thought God would never say that, and I was quoting scripture. That person is most likely not saved, but hopefully because of hearing scripture, that person may have started thinking about a few things. But can you give a reason from the scriptures? I mean, that is so important. Not a theological reason, not a philosophical reason, not a reason because this man said so. I mean, a reason from the words in this book that God has given us. Can you give a reason from these words why you're going to heaven? Because (laughs) these are the only words. These are the words that God will accept. Your reason for going to heaven must be based on these words, and these words alone. Everyone who dies without having been saved will go to hell. If you read the scriptures, the hell, hell is, it's called hell, but it's also called the grave, the pit. It has several names, and if you read what the scriptures say, the scriptures describe hell as a land of darkness, as darkness itself, a place where the light is as darkness a place in which the dead are gathered together, a place to which are attributed depths, bars, and gates, a place of heat and fire, a torment, a place of no return. Um, There's a scripture in Isaiah chapter 38 where it says, there is no hope for God's truth in this place. No hope for God's truth. And people don't praise God in hell. Isaiah chapter 38 doesn't use the word hell, it uses another word, uh, the dead, which are in hell, uh, they don't praise God. There is no praise of God in heaven. Once you're there, it's over. So now everyone look at Romans chapter 10, verse 5. Romans chapter 10, verse 5. If you don't have one of God's books, then listen. For Moses describeth the righteousness, which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved." For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the Greek being the Gentiles. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So if you're not saved, you need to follow what the scripture says. What the scripture says. You believe in your heart. You know that you're a sinner. You believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's why it's so important to call upon God, uh, Jesus Christ, for salvation. Specifically, Jesus Christ. And then it says, how shall they uh, hear without a preacher? Not just preachers and evangelists and pastors, but us. We have to go out and tell people. And so if you're not saved, 
someone can show you how to get saved. If you know someone who's not saved, you can show them how to get saved. And so that is the sermon. I pray that you take God's words to heart. Let his words be your words. Let his thoughts be your thoughts. His words first and foremost. Thank you.